any form of controls creates a rationing mechanism. Be it food uh, prices, or be it in, anything that you impose control creates a rational a, a rationing device. So essentially, because the market must clear, then it creates a, a capside, a parallel market to clear it. Now, that's, maybe that's too technical, but the most important thing is to say that if you are an exporter and you are exporting coffee, then you export to Europe and you get euros. Do you have an incentive to bring those euros to Kenya when you know that you'll have different difficulties trying to get it out? So that, that incentive, uh, that, that allows you to have an incentive not to declare. So essentially, the, company, the country start getting less and less of foreign exchange reserves. Similarly, are you going to produce maize if you know that you are, you are going to produce it at a price that is determined by the government and sometimes your cost of production will be higher? So the, the, then you have an incentive to produce and hold. But because sometimes it can be criminal, then sometimes it's you refuse to produce. So in, in a sense, it creates a disincentive to produce. It creates a disincentive to trade in the market because the prices are controlled. You cannot, you, 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 I cannot export because those proceeds, I will not get them, so I will not be flexible. It allows transfer pricing because then I would rather keep my money out there because I'm flexible with it. So essentially, it means that because of the distortion it creates in the market, we will never come back to it. Now, and you can see those countries that are practicing uh, capital controls or even price controls have not supported production activities. They have not supported commerce because commerce thrives when there are just regulations to allow commerce to, to, to thrive and the central bank sits back to, 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 for, uh, to perform its function of price stability. To controlling prices does not mean that you, you have less inflation. No. In fact, it can be worse because the true price is not what the government is controlling. The true price is how you can get <coughs> goods and services out there in the market, sometimes in informal markets. We have gone through, uh, can we say, we can have gone through stages of uh, economic management. And you can imagine, in those periods, all the countries in this region were exercising price control. The paradigm changed that in the, that's a, you know, remember structural adjustment? Yeah. Structural adjustment um, policies by the World Bank were actually, and, the, and perhaps even the IMF, were actually saying, let the market determine prices, and then you are going to see investment flowing in sectors that are profitable, okay? That's why you, you realize if you, want to, if you want to look at the history, you can see that why did we become the fastest, uh, and maybe the first uh, cut flower exporter? And, and there were many investments there. So that is the paradigm change from the 70s. The 70s was if you control even credit allocation, you are going to define the priority sectors. But then the market cannot on its, on its own create or generate the resources that are required. So it is the thinking that also changed. As you continued with the price control because of scarcity, then it became a distortion. But don't forget that it was a policy that was there at the very beginning. All these countries in, were, were fixing prices. They th the thinking then was that for a young nation, it is going to direct growth in priority sectors. But then over time, the market starts uh, seeing that it is a constraint. As foreign exchange dipped, then controls tightened. And we actually argued that the best thing is to let remove the controls and let the market function, have strong, reg strong institutions to regulate the market. That is the, now the change in the, towards the end of the 80s. We changed, you remember even the, f the exchange control, uh, sorry, the, f the, the, exchange, the exchange rate policy changed from a fixed exchange rate to a crawling peg exchange rate. So this, this has been the thinking. But um, development thinking has, uh, in most countries, uh, changed just because of the necessity. Because essentially, if you wanted to encourage people to produce, then you needed to liberalize prices. But of course, we, we, most of price controls were helping the agricultural sector, for example, food prices. They were having guaranteed prices for the future. You can imagine. So it has its own pitfalls. But the most important thing is that it encouraged the market to grow. There has never been a shortage of currency. But uh, coins, uh, that, that is notes. And there has never been a shortage. Of course, there has been a complaint about the cleanness of uh, the notes, and we are working on that. 
because essentially we're also encouraging people to have a wallet, to store money nicely, because you, you can imagine when you have uh, uh, people in the informal sector and they, 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 the, way they, the, the way they handle the currency, the, the, the complaint has been uh, clean notes. That one we are handling. But coins all over the world ha are always a problem. Because most people tend not to carry coins and they tend to hold them. And we can see the successes we have had when we go into, we had a currency week and we were trying to mobilize people to remove the coins from their cars, from the corners of their bedroom, from their offices, you know. And, and, and we succeeded. We can see the coins are there. We know how much is there. It's, only, it's a question of distribution. And we, have, we are trying to effect or to work out on the distribution mechanism. But we're still getting more coins and issuing more coins. So this is a period where the holding process, you know, most people, you know, we have to encourage people to use coins in the market. Yeah. One of them is creating a deeper market. Deepening the market is, a, you know, you have several products. You can go, go into a bank and they can give you a solution. Two, you know, the role of banks is actually to create an infrastructure for screening and monitoring borrowers, clients, or even potential borrowers. And they have done that very well, although I would like them to do more. You see, the initial thing, when, when, there, is, when there is risk in the market, what do banks do? Banks invest in government securities, which are risk-free. What happens is that they relegate their screening and monitoring role of, of new and potential borrowers uh, to the background. That's why, you know, everybody every complains in Africa that banks make a lot of profit. It's because they invest in government securities for, that are risk-free. Now, what, but our banks have gone out and said, oh, you cannot rely on this every day. You have to compensate other things. So for me, the most important thing is to be receptive about having, you know, coming up and joining up the market. You see, Moving from 1.9 million deposit uh, accounts in 2002 to 17.6 million, it's not the central bank said you must do this. It is them taking advantage of the market. So what I can say is that they have taken advantage and uh, developed the market. The third one is that they have financed projects. And they have even participated in financing long-term long -term projects. Turn anywhere, you see housing projects coming up. You ask yourself, how are they being financed by the, by, the, by, by the commercial banks? Because this is like mortgage finance. They are being financed in uh, like tranches. And for us, we are happy. We are seeing uh, the vibrancy whenever there is economic, when, whenever there is, um, you can look at manufacturing industry and look at how they function in terms of overdraft facilities. You can see. So they have taken up finance. So I'm happy about the banks. But of course, we can do more in terms of uh, uh, going further to reduce the cost of doing business. They have done this at the hostile conditions, but now that conditions are improving, we might want to ask them, hey, how do you bring down cost of doing business? We have participated in bringing cost of doing business down. I started with information sharing. That is one aspect. We have gone into agency banking, so they don't have to create uh, branches all over, even in non-economic areas. Uh, we have gone into, uh, that's agency banking, we have gone into allowing them to come up with innovative products that use technological platform like mobile phone financial services. We have created currency centers to take business, to take service to them. They don't have to come all the way to headquarters, congested areas, all branches to get their currency. We have created a currency center in Nakuru, in Nyeri, and in Meru. Happily that the KBA is pays for the rent for those places that we are in. We, it's good partnership, but the beauty of it is that we, it is reducing cost of doing business. So essentially we are happy about that. Of course, the future is that the banks have to do more to also now to reduce the cost of their financial services, given that we have worked so hard with the government to lower the cost of doing business. There are heavy payers. There are heavy uh, revenue payers. That's one aspect. Two, they have pulled the economic, economic growth with them. In 2010, the, 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 the growth in the sector was about 9%, and the economy was grew at 5.6%. When it dipped, the financial system was growing at 7.8%, the economy was growing at 4.4%. Right now, this year, last year, the, economy, the, the, the sector was growing at 10%, and obviously that is going to pull the economy with it. But that is, there has dimensions to it. One is services, 
The other one is contribution to the revenue, tax revenue. The, gov the, the banks are st among us the top uh, payers of... Uh, have they always been like that? Remember, I'm doing history. Have they always been like this? No, it is an evolving. It has evolved. Of course, we didn't also have so many banks, yeah. and they didn't have so many customers. You see, it has it has been an evolution. Now let's let's look at if we only had 1.9 million deposit accounts, then your transactions were also small. Yeah. So as transactions has has increased because the number of customers reduces unit cost and raises the of course the transactions. So it is the transactions that have increased so that banks. One, they have improved their revenue base, so it means their profits, so it means taxation. So it, it has been something that has occurred over time. They were not like that, because if they had a, such a small base in terms of operation, customer, and even capital, then of course they were not going to amass, uh, to, to make enough profits. And now we have gone in even, uh, uh, of course, uh, taxing their transactions. And of course you see that. But from a, basic, from a pure uh, income point of view, for example, they have moved from about 5.7 from 2002, 5.7 billion in terms of um, uh, profits to 105 billion in terms of profits. So you can imagine the taxation has also increased with it. So growth in itself brings a lot of positives. So the decades of growth, I have also seen that revenues, tax revenues have increased, profits have increased. It has been the best uh, relationship because so far we have done projects together. We started with currency, uh, cur uh, currency centers. We went to check truncation together. Then we went to information sharing, uh, if that is credit reference bureaus. And then we also decided to go into the, the, this risk-based uh, consolidated supervision and supervisory colleges together. All these, even revising the rules, the guidelines we do that together it's through consultative process so that when once we say that this is agreed these are going to be the guidelines we agree on the timing and everybody abide so i think we have made sure that we do everything that uh, we, in, in terms of regulation through consultation with the kba okay. and yeah. also and also also even when we monetary policy i call the the the, the kba and the ceos to come and listen how wide what was the basis of the decision on monetary policy then, and then we have a survey through the KBA. Of every two months we do a survey in the banks and the non-banks to understand the expectations in the market.